Let's play a game. Imagine you tie two electrons to the ends of a string and gently release them. What happens? Like charges repel and they fly apart in opposite directions, settling 180 degrees apart along a straight line. What if you connect three electrons with the strings and let go? This time they arrange themselves into a perfect equilateral triangle. Each one is placed exactly 120 degrees from the others. Why do they settle into such precise symmetric shapes? Of course, the system wants to minimize repulsion and this symmetric arrangement give maximum separation. And even more remarkably, they ensure the net force on the system is zero. That is, the system is in equilibrium. Let's go one step further. What if we place four electrons? Our intuition might suggest they would form a square in a plane spaced 90 degrees apart, but they don't. We live in a 3D world. Instead, they settle into a regular tetrahedron spanning the whole three-dimensional space. Why? Because in three dimensions, tetrahedron provides better spacing. More precisely, it achieves maximum symmetry and ensures that net force on the system cancel out in three dimensions. This simple game with strings is actually very similar to a well-known classic problem in physics called the Thomson's problem. Instead of tying charges with strings, the Thomson's problem asks, how do multiple electrons arrange themselves on the surface of a sphere? The answer? They spread out as symmetrically as possible to minimize their electrostatic potential energy, often aligning with the vortices of platonic solids. For example, with four charges, they form a tetrahedron, with five, a triangular dipyramid, with six, a regular octahedron, and so on. In this video, we are not solving the Thomson's problem explicitly, but we are using it as a powerful base. Which shows us, nature doesn't arrange things randomly, it arranges them symmetrically, because symmetry brings balance, stability, and efficiency. But can we? prove mathematically that symmetry truly brings balance. Saying that symmetry brings balance in general is poetic, but also vague and impossible to prove in a purely philosophical sense. But in physics and mathematics, however, balance has a precise meaning, equilibrium. Of course, not every symmetric arrangement guarantees balance in the real world, but in idealized mathematics and physics, when identical forces or charges are symmetrically arranged, they often result in a symmetric vector configuration, whose sum is exactly zero, giving the lowest energy configuration. And that is the claim we want to prove in this video. So let's test this idea mathematically. We will start simple, in the flat two-dimensional space. If we confine our charges to a plane, they naturally arrange themselves evenly around the circle, and that gives us a perfectly symmetric vector configuration. An equal length arrow is equally spaced by an angle of 2 pi over n and pointing radially outward. In my last video, what we found was beautiful. The vector's total sum is zero, so that configuration is in perfect equilibrium. We first approach it visually, that is, if you connect these vectors head to tail, they form a closed polygon. And that loop implies there is no displacement, so the sum must be zero. But mathematicians are not always satisfied with visual reasoning alone. So I wanted to offer a deeper mathematical proof. We first place these vectors into xy plane. And for simplicity, we assume each vector has a magnitude of 1. Each of these vectors can be expressed as the sum of its x and y components, given by... Then your total vector sum is... Now, to show that total vector sum is zero, we must prove that both the x and y components to be zero simultaneously. There might be ways to approach this using trigonometry. I haven't found one myself. If anyone has a clever trick, feel free to drop it in the comments below. But here is a far more elegant way to prove it using Euler's formula. But even before diving into that, I wanted to verify this computationally. So I wrote a simple Python program to some of these vectors, and yes, it works. Now, we move this group of vectors into the complex plane, where the x component corresponds to the real part and y component to the imaginary part. Thanks to Euler's formula, each vector can be written in exponential form. When we take the sum of the exponential and expand it, we get a geometric series, which evaluates to zero. And if you are familiar with the concepts of roots of unity, the result is even more immediate. The same principle can be extended beyond discrete vectors. We can prove that total vector sum is zero for continuous distributions of vectors, like a charged ring, for example. Visually, we can think of it as composed of infinitely many tiny charged elements dq. And for every dq, there is a directly opposite element dq prime, 
whose electric field cancels it out. Mathematically, as n approaches infinity, the discrete sum can be approximated by an integral using Riemann sums, and evaluating the integral gives zero. So even in the continuous limit, the result still holds. That was all in two dimensions. This time, I want to go deeper. What happens in three dimensions? Of course, such a symmetry gives balance in three dimensions too. But can we still prove the result? In two dimensions, things are simple. We only deal with a single angle theta and the coordinates of the vector on the unit circle is given by cos theta and sin theta. And as theta sweeps from 0 to 2 pi, the sum becomes. So can we do something similar in three dimensions? Yes. In spherical coordinates, each point on the sphere is determined by two angles, phi ranging from 0 to pi, the polar angle, like the latitude, and theta, varying from 0 to 2 pi, the azimuthal angle, like the longitude, and the 3D coordinates of unit vector pointing in that direction are. So, we can construct a symmetric configuration using a nested double sum over these angles. This indeed gives a total sum of 0, and it follows naturally from the symmetry of sine and cosine sums we already used in two dimensions. We can visualize it this way. For a fixed phi, rotating theta through 2 pi generates a ring of vectors evenly spaced around the circle, just like the 2D case. Since the vector sum of each ring vanishes, we repeat this process for multiple values of phi, stacking rings at different latitudes. So intuitively, the total vector sum vanishes because each ring contributes zero. Mathematically, this means we can factor out the phi dependent term for constant sine phi from the x and y components, and we get the same identity we proved earlier in two dimensions. And we already know that this sum is zero, so the entire xy part vanishes for every ring. To show the z component vanishes, we observe this is a symmetric sum over cos phi, which also cancels out when sampled evenly over the interval 0 to pi. Every term above the equator cancels with its mirror below and the poles. We can even apply Euler's formula again for more elegant proof. To verify, we can even run a simple Python program using a nested loop for different values of n and m. But here is a problem. This double sum doesn't always capture the lowest energy configurations in Thomson's problem, though it's zero. For example, in the case of tetrahedron, no choice of m and n in the double sum will reproduce it because it's not aligned with the latitude longitude symmetry. However, we can make it work for five and six charges. For instance, five charges can be represented by setting m equals two and n equals three. Three charges in the equator, one at the top and one at the bottom. Six charges works with m equals two, n equals four, four charges in the equator, one at the top and one at the bottom. So it seems the double sum succeeds in some cases, but definitely fails in others like tetrahedron. This suggests a simple rule of thumb. For every small n, the double sum may fail to capture the true lowest energy arrangement in the Thomson's problem. But only five platonic solids exist, and small n often prefers these special shapes. But as n grows, such perfect solid does not exist, and the distribution becomes uniform, making the double sum a good approximation. And in fact, as n and m approaches infinity, it becomes a Riemann sum that converges into a double integral over the sphere. What do you think? I would love to hear it in the comments. Once we have established balance in 2D and 3D, a natural question arises. What about 4D or even 5? And yes, the same principle still holds in higher dimensions. That's the whole other journey involving hyperspheres, multiple angles, and some beautiful pure math generalizations. Honestly, it can get heavy and I don't want to scare you off with too much math all at once. So for this video, let's just keep the big idea. In every dimension, symmetry enforces balance. We will save the full deep dive into 4D and beyond for another time. Up to this point, we have used some trigonometry and integrals to understand why symmetric vector arrangements cancel out. I have always been drawn to this kind of analytic proof, but our argument in three dimensions leans more towards the continuous case. But after my last video, someone left a comment suggesting a completely different approach using rotational symmetry, inspired by the ideas from group theory. 
Now, I'll be honest, I did not much have background in the group theory at that time. I did not really know how it connected to any of this. He demonstrated this idea beautifully in 2D and once I saw it, everything clicked. Let's start with simple two dimensions again. We already saw this vector sum written in exponential form. Let's call this sum S. Expanding it keeps. Now let's multiply both sides by e to the 2 pi i over n. We will soon see why. So this new sum is exactly the same as S, just cyclically shifted. That means Geometrically, what we did was rotate each vector by 2 pi over n, and yet the overall vector sum did not change. Now, here's the key point. We know e to the 2 pi i over n is number 1 for n greater than 1. So, the only solution is s equals 0. In more group theory language, this rotation we applied is called a group action, and our vector sum s is invariant under that action. And not just that one, we could rotate it by 2 pi over n, 6 pi over n, all the way up to 2 pi. And each of these rotations is a part of a group. Let's call it Rk. And then applying any group element Rj gives Rj equals s for all j, and therefore s equals 0. Now, in 2D, we have Euler's formula which makes rotations feel easy in the complex plane. But remember, all Euler's formula did here was rotate the vectors. We can do the exact same thing with matrix transformations. To rotate a vector by angle theta, we use the following rotation matrix. And just like before, we can build a whole collection of these rotations. And these collections form a group, which mathematicians call SO2. What happens when we step in 3D? Here, there are 3 by 3 matrices, a part of bigger group called SO3. For instance, our rotation around z-axis looks like this. There are similar ones for rotation about x and y-axis. And by combining them, we can get any possible rotation in 3 dimensions. Now, here's the key idea. If you place points at the corners of a perfectly symmetric object like a tetrahedron, every rotation in this group just permutes the points. The sum of those vectors doesn't change, and the only vector that can stay the same under all possible rotations is a zero vector. So once again, the sum must vanish. And this idea doesn't stop in 3D. In fact, in any number of dimensions, rotations are represented by n by n matrices in a group as O n. As long as your arrangement is symmetric enough, goes under a rich enough set of rotations, the exact same reasoning applies. To me, that's the beauty of this group theory argument. It's not just a trick with formulas, it's a deep property of symmetry itself. And there you have it. Throughout this journey, we saw how physical intuition, Euler's formula, and group theory all come together to reveal one powerful idea. Symmetry doesn't just look beautiful, it forces balance. Whether it's polygons on a plane, platonic solids in space or continuous distributions on a sphere, the mathematics leaves no room for imbalance, and that's why nature leans on symmetry so often. Thanks for watching, and in the spirit of summer of math exposition, I hope this video sparks the idea that both teachers and students find useful. I'll see you in the next one.